9 degrees centigrade, which is 48 Fahrenheit, 83% humidity, bit of blue sky up there, 1017 millibars on the barometer, and the wind, it's a cold wind, you know, from the west, just a little bit above a breeze. It's not exactly a breeze, it's a bit of a wind, not very nice at all. And the time, where are we? Quarter to seven in the morning. The sun is shining at least. Tradesmen, that's plumbers, electricians, painter and decorator, roofers, people that did roofing, gardeners, I suppose. They got a trade, their tradesmen, laying paving slabs, driveways. So many people, I don't know about these days, we do have obviously plumbers, electricians and the rest of it, but are they known as tradesmen? In the old days, now I remember this, there'd be a large house, and well even a smaller house, and on the side gate by the side of the property, there'd be a notice, tradesman's entrance. Tradesmen weren't allowed to go through the house. Stone the crows, you can't have that. You can't have the electrician going in the front door of the house. He'd have to go around the back. Of course, he'd work in the house once he was there, but I suppose you couldn't have neighbours seeing some common <laughs> tradesman going in the front door. Honestly, it was awful when you think about it. I do remember. In fact, this has just come to mind. I remember when I went out and did the odd TV repair. I was mainly in the workshop. But now and then the boss would say, can you go to so-and-so address and sort their telly out? I went to a house, knocked on the front door, and the lady said, yes, can I help you? I said, yeah, TV engine, around the side, trains were entrance, around the side, off you go. Slam the front door shut. <laughs> I thought, well, that's nice. I suppose, though, I was a tradesman. I was a TV engineer. Anyway, there we are. All good fun. I'll be talking a little bit more about that later. Now, Kevin, nice to hear from you. Kevin's dad was a school teacher. Kevin's emailed me with the interviews in mind because I mentioned a school teacher or perhaps a motor mechanic from the 50s or 60s. Kevin's dad, unfortunately, has passed away, but he was a teacher at a secondary school for boys back in the 60s. Now, his dad, according to Kevin, hated school when he was a child. He hated it. But when he left school, he studied and became a teacher at the very school he hated. Now, Kevin's saying you might wonder why he went back to the same school that he hated. According to his dad, <laughs> this is funny, it was to get his own back on the school. I don't quite know how that works, Kevin, but if that's what your dad said, that's fair enough. Apparently his dad was just like me, hated school, hated everything about it. And the most interesting thing is that Kevin has pointed out is his dad said that the boys' school churned out factory workers, which is exactly what I've been saying over the years. My sister went to a girls' school where they churned out future housewives. They were taught to cook, to darn, to sew, to knit, all this housewife stuff, housekeeping, all that stuff, while us boys were taught in the metal workshop to use lathes, the wood workshop, our school was churning out factory workers. I know people have come back to me before and said, oh, that's not true, you can't say that. Well, Kevin's dad, who was a school teacher in the 60s, said exactly the same that I have said, so that's coming from a teacher. Thank you for that, Kevin, that's really interesting, actually. Did you have jotters at school? We used to call them jotters or rough jotters. They were for scribbling things in, making quick notes, doing quick calculations. I used to draw diagrams of radios in mine, which the teacher wasn't impressed with. Jotters and the inkwell. Who's old enough to remember the inkwell? I am. We actually had on the desk an inkwell in a hole in the wooden desk and you dip your nib in there, your pen, dip it in there, do your writing. Dip it in the ink well again, do some more writing. I know I'm showing my age. That was the 50s when I was at primary school. Now, primary school is what? kind of Is it five years old? Oh, no, that's infants, isn't it? I don't know. I was about eight years old, I suppose. Eight, nine, ten. I had to dip the nib in the ink well. How old am I? <laughs> you think I'm talking about 1890 something or other. Not the 50s, 1950s. Kevin ended by saying his dad would have been an ideal candidate to interview about uh, school teaching back in those days. A couple of people, actually. Who was it? Uh, Brian from... Uh, where are you, Brian? So Anglesey. Oh, that's right, Anglesey. Here we are. I've got my notes. Brian says his dad was a motor mechanic in the 50s. He's passed away now, sadly. 
He said he would have loved to have had a chat about the old cars back then. And Brian says, I think the problem you're up against is you wanting to speak to people that were adults out at work in various trades and professions back in the 50s and 60s. And of course, they're going to be very old now. That's exactly what I said, Brian, isn't it? Last Wednesday on the midweek message, people are going to be like 110, 120 years old. And uh, there aren't many of those around, I'm afraid. Our service manager at the radio and TV workshop in the 60s, he would have been brilliant. I I was, what, uh, 15 when I started there as an apprentice. He was in his 40s then, so he's obviously not around now. But he would have been fantastic. He was a character, a real character. (laughs) I'm not going to harp on that because I think I've mentioned him before, but uh, a lot of people locally, a lot of my friends who used to be radio and TV engineers, They all talk about him. Even today, these days, they talk about him back in the 60s. He would have been terrific. And there was a chap that ran a a sweet shop just over the road from uh, where we were in the TV place. He used to deliver paraffin on, on his bicycle, pulling a trolley that he'd made, a wooden trolley with pram wheels full of paraffin cans. And he'd go around to people's homes delivering paraffin for their paraffin heaters. This is way before central heating and all that. He used to cycle off down the road. We used to watch him cycle off down the road with his trolley full of these. He'd painted them all brown, all the cans, and uh, he'd cycle off down the road. (laughs) That was funny. And in his shop, we'd go in there to buy our cigarettes. He had one 40-watt light bulb. We know it was 40 watts. We had a look at it. No shade, nothing like that in this little old shop wooden floorboards, wooden counter, wooden shelves, straight out of, what, the 1920s? Which it probably was. I think he'd been there that long. He must have been in his, well, certainly his 60s. And in the winter, of course, it gets dark at four, half four in the afternoon. We worked till six, I believe. We'd go over there in the winter and it's dark. There's this 40-watt light bulb hanging from the ceiling in the middle of the shop. You could barely see. We used to wind him up. We used to take a torch with us and shine it on the shelves. Oh, can I have, uh, where are they? Oh, look, there we are. Can I have uh, 20 number six, please, and a box of matches? And we'd shine the torch on the cigarettes. He was a funny old chap. I think all he sold really was cigarettes and paraffin. He had a few sweets, but it was a little bit dodgy how long they'd actually been there on this wooden rack on the counter. They could have been there several years And we know he had mice in the shop. That brings me on nicely to something else in a minute because we used to see mice in the shop scurrying around. (laughs) So they were probably eating the sweets. I don't know. But one day we were in there and we were shocked. We were. were, Our backs were taken. Taken aback we were. The lady we'd always thought to be his wife, lovely lady, always jolly and smiling, she was chatting to us. I don't know how we got round to the subject. And she said, oh, no, we're not married. We were looking at each other, shocked. This is the 60s. A lot of stigma about living in sin and all that was still going around then. Doesn't matter these days. One of the lads said, you live together in sin? And she laughed her head off. She said, oh yes, yes, we love it. No point in getting married. We were shocked because we had always thought that they were were really old-fashioned. Their staunch ways, if you know what I mean. And to live in sin, stone the crows. You know, they wouldn't dream of it. And there they were, actually. Of course, after that, we used to look at him and think, oh, you... <laughs> well, it doesn't matter what we thought. I won't tell you that. But, uh, well, good luck to them. Why not? They were a great couple. He was all right. He was very strange. He was fine with us. Bear in mind, we were in our teens, early 20s. And although we had a laugh and mucked about, it was nothing bad. And we did spend a lot of money there. We bought all our cigarettes there and various other bits and pieces. We did buy sweets there. They weren't uh, out of date. Well, they might have been out of date. Did we have dates on things back in the 60s, the early 60s? I don't know. I can't remember. I don't think they had sell-by dates. Anyway, the mouse business in his shop, that brought me on to something else very nicely. We've had a mouse under our shed. Now, we had this years ago. And I saw Mickey the first time about seven days ago. So I put the humane trap out and I caught him. And I took him down the alleyway, put him over the back into the field. Next day, mouse in the trap, I put him in the field. Next day, mouse in the trap, you get the idea. Now I'm wondering whether it's the same mouse. 
A couple of years ago, I caught 23 mice, one, or I think just about every day, for 23 days, and I really was thinking, is this the same mouse? I was going to put food colouring on him or something, but it, it was awkward. He was scurrying about in the little cage. Would have been very difficult. So I've been reading up about it. Apparently, a, a mouse, his homing range is two miles or maybe more. So if you dump him two miles away, he'll come back home. His home being our home, <laughs> our shed. Now that's interesting. How on earth do they do that? I know they're homing pigeons. They reckon they've got like a compass in their brain. Well, not a compass with a needle, you know, but something in their brain that they can detect the Earth's magnetic field so they know which direction they're going in, blah, blah, blah. Well, have mice got that? Perhaps they've got GPS fitted. <laughs> I don't know. But someone's done some research and presumably it's correct. It really is odd. So if I took him, which I am tomorrow, when, when he or one of his mates is in the little cage, we're going to see my mother. She's just over two miles away and she lives next to a park. We're going to put him in the park. I doubt that he'll come back from over two miles. That way I will know if there's a mouse the following day, then it's a different mouse. But I just found that interesting. I thought I'd mention that. Years ago, we had mice in the kitchen, not in this house, another house, mice in the kitchen. I found out where they were getting in through an air vent in the brick. And then under the floorboards, they came up under the kitchen cupboards into where we kept the cereals. And we were finding that cereals were, the cardboard boxes were chewed. The cereals had all spewed out and there's mouse droppings everywhere. <laughs> so we solved that one by blocking up the various places where he got in. But uh, I don't mind the mice in the garden. It's when they start coming in the house and they have got in the shed and they've started to chew up things in the shed. So that's when you have to put a stop to it. I've had several more emails since I spoke to you on Wednesday from people saying they would love to have heard more from Nurse Diane. The response has really been unprecedented. I've never had so many emails about one episode before, one subject. So that's really good. It worked well. And uh, Diane and I will do another chat. I'm not too sure where we will go with it this time because she talked about how she got into the job. I suppose more about the job back in the early 80s than into the 90s, what it was like then, perhaps more of what the job entailed, I don't know. But a lot of you seem to want to hear more, so that's what we shall do. Back in the 50s, 60s, there were mice around then. There were a lot of fields around, a lot of farmland. And where we lived, we weren't far from a farm or a couple of farms, fields, rough ground, and of course mice and rats, of course. They, that's where they lived, they loved it. And they'd come into people's gardens and houses looking for food. Back then, people used the proper traps, you know, the mouse traps that just killed them. I don't like doing that. I don't like killing things because they've got big eyes. When I go down to the trap, they look up at me with their big eyes. And what I have, what I have noticed, I'm not going to go on about traps all, all the time, but what I have noticed is the cheese I put in this trap, they eat all of that. It's all gone every time, quite a big lump of cheese. So I reckon if it is one mouse, it's thinking, well, this is a good arrangement. I go in the cage the door shuts, I eat the cheese, the next morning I'm let out, I come back and then I eat the cheese, the door shuts and so it goes on. So he's getting a good free meal, coming to no harm, except he's stuck in the cage I think for a few hours overnight. So as far as he's concerned it's quite a good arrangement. I remember at school we had a cornfield next to us and uh, there were fi field mice, were they? Field mice? I've mentioned this before haven't I? Uh, having bells ringing do you know, I've got tinnitus. Have you got that? Is it tinnitus? There's ringing in my ear. It's getting worse as I get older. So when the combine harvester came along, you know, doing all the, the corn and stuff, us kids loved it. We're all looking through the fence in the playground watching this. And of course, all these mice were running into the playground. And of course, the girls were screaming. I don't, why do girls scream when there are mice around? And us boys are laughing. We thought that was hilarious because the girls were screaming. But there's these mice, the field mice, aren't they? All coming out of the cornfield as the combine harvest is going along. Great days. Not at school, but other things were great. Because after school, we'd go round to the farm and have a look to see what's going on. 
and they're doing all sorts of interesting things with tractors and machinery. It was just interesting. We had in town a, a shop called the Swap Shop. That was the name of it, the Swap Shop. And they had dinky cars, corgi cars, marbles, cigarette cards, all mainly boys' stuff. You know, that the boys filled their pockets with catapults, things like that. And they would swap. You could buy things or swap. If you took in some cigarette cards, the chap might say, oh, yeah, yeah, they're interesting. You, what do you want in exchange? And he'd say, well, I like that bag of marbles. Uh, yes, I'll do a direct swap with that. Or you can have the marbles, but give me the cigarette cards and sixpence. So you'd have to get your sixpence out, your tanner, which you were saving for a tanner's worth of chips, because just down the road was the chip shop. <laughs> but it was great having this swap shop. And he was fair. He didn't rip kids off. I went there quite a few times over the years when I was at school and it was always really good. He was genuine. I suppose that's the word to use. He didn't rip us off. He was a genuine chap. And if something wasn't worth anything, he would say, look, I'll take it. It's not really worth a great deal. But, you know, take the marbles. Go on, you can have those. But don't tell anyone that I've swapped that for that. And yeah, OK, yeah, that's great. Thanks, mister. <laughs> I forget his name. I think we called him Billy. Was it? Bi Hello, Billy. <laughs> Happy days. Going back to tradesmen, a friend of mine, he worked, in, this is in our teens, he worked in some shop as an assistant and he didn't like it. Whenever I saw him, he said, oh, it's boring. I think it was a local ironmonger. That's when we had ironmongers. We don't anymore, of course. And he said, I'm going to be a plumber. One day we were chatting in the pub. I'm going to be a plumber. I said, oh, yeah, what, what's that? You have to do a course or something? In those days, I don't believe you had to have any qualifications or training. You could just set up as a plumber or an electrician. It's very different now, of course. And uh, he said, no, no, I'm just going to start. He'd put an advert in the local paper. He lived at home with his parents, put their phone number in the, in the advert. They were fine with it. And he'd given his notice in at the shop. So basically from a, a week Monday, whatever it was, he was unemployed, but self-employed, I suppose, as a plumber. And the next, <laughs> the next time I saw him must have been two or three weeks later. I said, how are you doing? How's the plumbing work? And he said, you know, I've had several jobs and I've earned more in one week than I was getting wages at the shop. So that's good. <laughs> I was quite impressed, actually. I wouldn't want to be a plumber myself, but I was quite impressed. And whenever I saw him, he'd pop into the pub perhaps every two, maybe three weeks. He'd just pop in on a Friday evening where we all met. You know, it's a bit of a bit of a club, really, more than going to the pub. You know, we all met there on a Friday, which was nice because that's all gone. And whenever I saw him, how are you doing? Are you busy? I can't keep up with the work. I just can't keep up with it. The phone won't stop ringing. It was amazing. He was just doing so well. He went on, not like... Pimlico, is it Pimlico Plumbers in London, where the chap's now a, a millionaire? <laughs> Wasn't that good. But he went on to employ several people. He had his own vans for his plumbers. And well, they're called heating engineers now, aren't they? So he obviously made the right decision. I don't think he ever looked back. The last time I saw him must be, I don't know, 10 years ago. He was, he'd retired, he'd retired early. He had a nice house and he'd sold the business. So he did pretty well. It's really nice being self-employed. Well, as long as you're making some money, obviously. It's so nice because if someone says, oh, look, Thursday, so-and-so's happening. Can you get the day off? Yeah, I can work around that. That's what I would do when I was restoring the vintage valve radios. If Trish said, look, next Thursday, so-and-so's happening in the afternoon, I'd say, OK, I'll make sure I've got Thursday clear. No customers coming round. No parcels being delivered or collected. And I'd have the day off. That's the beauty of being self-employed, of course. There again, if you take a day off, you're not earning any money, of course. You bear that in mind. <laughs> if you've got a shop and you want the day off, you've got to close the shop. So you lose a day's takings, but you can work round it. I didn't lose money by having a day off. If I was repairing someone's radio, I wanted Thursday off. I'd either finish it Wednesday or delay it to Friday. I didn't really lose money, if you see what I mean. Look, the sun's out again now. We have had... Blue sky and sun, beautiful weather, been sitting out there in the garden. Then the next minute, lashing rain, clouds disappear, the sun's out again, no wind at all. Then quite a, a not a gale force wind, but quite a, a breeze out there. It doesn't know what it's doing. 
tradesmen, lovely people. Can you imagine if they did away with cash? They're always on about doing away with cash, aren't they? In the old days, well, probably these days, while we still have cash, can you imagine a chap coming round? How much will that cost me? I'll tell you what, cash job, I'll do it for 50 quid. All right, then, yep, there you go, 50 quid, thanks. Now, he's not going to declare that, is he? He's not going to pay tax on it. Well, that's his problem, his business, not mine. I mean, if someone says, look, I'll do it half the price if you give me cash. Well, uh, am I breaking any law or is he? Well, he is if he's not declaring it to the Inland Revenue. I'm just paying him for the job. So I don't, <laughs> I don't know whether I'd be prosecuted for giving someone cash or I don't know. I really don't know. But of course, if cash disappears, then all these, what are they known as, cheeky little cash jobs, they would disappear. What do you do? I could say, I'll tell you what, I've got some tomato plants and some raspberries. How about a couple of pounds of tomatoes and some raspberries? Will that cover the tap washer you've just replaced? <laughs> I do tap washers myself, of course. What do they call it? The black market or something? I think that's what's known as the black market. So all the cash jobs would disappear. People would put their prices up because they've got to pay tax on everything. So <laughs> I don't know. It wouldn't be a very good idea. Of course, defrauding the inland revenue, you're actually, in Britain, of course, you're defrauding the crown, the king. You're actually defrauding the king. You could be sent to the tower. <laughs> you earned five quid and you didn't declare it. That fiver, that fiver tip, you should have declared that. To the tower, off with his head. Someone said to me many, many years ago, the inland revenue is there to be defrauded, to be ripped off. <laughs> I don't think that's the reason they're there, but it sounded quite good. What do you call it in America? Is it the IRS, Inland Revenue Services, I believe? Is your IRS, are they there? Are they there to be ripped off? <laughs> no, of course they're not. Of course they're not. Back in the 1960s, the tax man, as he was known, the Inland Revenue, they were quite, uh, what's the word? I mustn't be rude about the revenue. I'll be arrested. They, they used to get quite angry quite annoyed if they thought someone was ripping them off. They'd go round to your house and they would look around. They would check. Let me see in your handbag, to, you, to the wife. Let me see in your handbag. What money have you got? What cash have you got in the house? What have you got in the way of expensive jewellery? They could do that. They were able to do that. And I do know people that that happened to. I know one chap, he was self-employed, and they called at his house and he was out at the time. And they said to his wife, Open your handbag. We want to see what you've got in there, what you've got in the way of cash. And she had to show them. He hadn't done anything wrong. I don't know what it was. They made some mistake or other. He hadn't ripped anyone off. Well, if he had, he'd done it properly. <laughs> properly. Now, I mustn't laugh. I, I might get arrested. The thought police might come round. So they were that strict. Another chap I knew, he owned a small hotel, only a very small hotel, and they went round to him and they looked in his bathroom and said, where did you get that soap from on your on your basin there, that soap? And he said, well, what do you mean where I get it? I bought it. I, I buy soap. Where do you think I got it from? Do you buy it along with the soap that you put in the hotel rooms for the punters? And he said, no, he, he sussed what they meant. He did. He just buy soap for all the rooms and some for himself. Cleaning materials for his quarters, his flat. Well, he used the, the cleaning stuff that he bought for the hotel to clean all the rooms. He didn't have it separate. And, of course, they had a right go at him. They didn't actually prove anything because he didn't keep receipts for his own stuff. If he bought a bar of soap for himself, he didn't keep the receipt for that. And they said, well, in future, you've got to. You must have receipts for your own stuff. They really were quite... I, I keep thinking of a word I mustn't use, but they were quite strict in the old days. And the VAT man, the VAT man, he could call quite legally at your house at three in the morning, bash on the front door and gain entry, insist that you let him in. This was a VAT man back in the old days. Again, I don't think they're quite like that now, but uh, well, I don't know, maybe they are. I don't think these days with local businesses like a small electrician or plumber, even if he's got a little shop. I don't think they do the raids like they used to. It's different now. They go after the big boys. <laughs> I think the the tax people, I think they look at anyone, any small chap that's self-employed, I think they must look at him as some, some sort of thief or criminal. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I don't know that. 
That's just what I'm thinking. They must look upon small tradesmen, self-employed people as crooks. <laughs> They're all crooks. We'll start there. What tax do you owe? Right, well, let's start off assuming that you're a crook and we'll go from there. <laughs> A friend of mine, way back in the 70s, was it? He was a fireman. Oh, no, you can't call them firemen these days. He was a, f a fire fighter. Got to get it right. In case he was a fire person, he might not have been a man. So, anyway, he was a fire human being. <laughs> Crazy. He did shift work, obviously, because firemen worked all night. They're on call all night or, or all day, whatever. And he did shift work. When he was off in the day, obviously he went to sleep, say in the afternoon, he was free, he would do washing machine repairs. And, you know, he had quite a business going. I remember him saying to me that some weeks he earned as much doing washing machine repairs on the side as he did as a fireman. So he was, in effect, doubling his wage by doing washing machine repairs whenever he was off during the day. I remember him saying to me that a lot of people at work at his you know, fire station, they did all sorts of things, gardening and all sorts of painting, decorating, when they were off during the day to build up their money, or in his case, sometimes double the money. Another friend of mine was a train driver. And again, he did shift work. He could start at five or six in the morning. Or he was on late shift where he finished, say, midnight on the last train, whatever time that was. He very often had time off in the day, either all morning or all afternoon. And what he did on the side, <laughs> he had a trailer on the back of his car, two petrol lawnmowers there, and a big bag thing for collecting grass, other bits of gardening equipment. He went round mowing people's lawns. I remember he did a couple of our neighbours many years ago. This is again is the, where are we, 70s, early 80s. And I remember him saying to me that he really did make up his money because back then train drivers, what were they on about? I can't remember what they were on. Probably about 20,000, if that, 15,000. I don't know, I really can't remember. So delete that, erase that bit. But he really did build up his money because him and his wife, they'd, they'd like to go out for a meal together. They have perhaps weekends away if he was off. And it paid for all that. It covered all that. So it was really handy. When I was in the radio and TV trade, a lot of people did what we called private jobs for neighbours, not necessarily family and friends because you wouldn't charge them, but neighbours possibly, other people, word would get round, oh, give so-and-so a ring, he'll fix your telly. And again, they made up their money by doing these private jobs, PJs they were called, PJs. So the fireman, the train driver, <laughs> various other people television engineers, they're getting cash. Did they declare their earnings to the Inland Revenue? Oh, well, I've just charged that chap there £8 for cutting his front and back lawns. There's my £8 I'll have to pay tax on. Did they heckers like? Where's that? That's, is that Yorkshire? Did they heckers like? E by gum. <laughs> so there's all this black market stuff going on, people doing cash jobs. I really don't think that doing away with cash is going to do a, anyone any good. I, I don't know how it would work. Other work on the side included bar work in the evenings. I know quite a few people that used to do bar work, mainly girls. I don't know why it was mainly girls. They'd finish their office job or whatever they did during the day, go home, have something to eat. Then the pub would open at six and they'd be there behind the bar doing an evening shift or weekend shifts, of course, in the bar the local pub. That worked well for them. Actually, the more I think back to the old days about people and what they did on the side, the more I'm remembering things. A friend of mine did taxi work in the evenings. He finished work, had his dinner, and then went out in a taxi and did that till midnight. Of course, we were all a lot younger then. These days, I couldn't do taxi work till midnight. <laughs> I'd, be, I'd need a week off after that staying up till midnight, driving around the town. But he did that and he got tips and he got a lot of, lot of cash out of that. Again, all cash. And something that was quite popular, I knew one chap in particular, he was a general handyman. He would do painting and decorating. He'd look at your car. And in fact, I, I know of another train driver that in his spare time he did car repairs because he was pretty, 
pretty much up on engines and things like that back in the 60s. He did car repairs when he wasn't working, and he did very well out of that. But the general handyman thing, this chap, what was his name, Brian, he was always busy doing various things. He would do anything from uh, dripping tap to fitting a new power point, because you can't do that now. You can't just go around doing electrical work on people's houses. You have to be, what, you have to be registered or something or trained. I don't know what you have to be. But back then, I mean, I fitted power points in people's houses and charged them a, a fiver in the old days or whatever it was. And of course, I did declare that to the Inland Revenue. Obviously, I went to the tax man and said, look, I've just, just charged so-and-so five pounds. <laughs> Happy days. But uh, this Brian, he did all sorts of work, anything from electrical, plumbing, painting, decorating. He fitted, uh, for a friend of mine, uh, those, is it Velux window? You know, the loft type windows you take a few tiles off, saw a few beams off in the loft to the you know, roof caves in and, and fit this window. And he did it very well. He wasn't uh, what we used to call a bodger. He didn't bodge stuff. He did it properly. He did a really good job. He would do plastering. In fact, I don't think there's anything, <laughs> looking back, I don't think there was anything that he didn't do or couldn't do. I can't lay carpets. I have tried, I just can't lay carpets. I can do decorating, electrical, plumbing, fix the car, well, not cars these days. You open the, the bonnet or the hood, if you're in the States, and all you can see is a load of plastic boxes. I don't know where the engine is. <laughs> it's disappeared somewhere. That must be in a big plastic box underneath somewhere. Now, does this happen these days? I don't know, because I most of the work we need doing here, I do myself. We did have to get a roofer in to do the roof. I'm not going up there. But are there all these tradesmen and handymen around these days, I wonder? One of my neighbours, when I was early teens, he was a school teacher, not at my school, as it happens, he was a school teacher, and he did, he did gardening. He'd get home from school, what, four, half four, something like that, in the summer, and he was off. He'd have a bite to eat, and he was off doing people's gardens, hedge trimming, pruning bushes. I don't know whether he mowed lawns. I think he did, actually, if they had their own lawnmower, he would do it, but all sorts of things in the garden, and that was all cash. <laughs> I saw him once. He'd come back from doing some gardening, and he was standing by his front door, counting out a load of pound notes. And I bet he didn't tell the revenue about that. Anyway, I can't think of any more. There must be loads more people that I knew that did repair work or whatever work on the side to earn cash. In the days before cash, of course, it was all bartering, wasn't it? I'll give you two lettuces, a load of tomatoes, sack of potatoes and whatever, in exchange for your goat, because I need a goat. <laughs> that must have been a good way of trading, actually. I wonder whether it'll come back to that. If there's no such thing as cash, perhaps it will come back to that. In fact, a chap fitted for us a second-hand carpet. We were given a second-hand carpet for our lounge. This is years ago. And it was as new. The person that had it didn't want it. The wrong colour. It was as new, and we loved the colour. And I phoned this local carpet chap... He came round and he said, oh, I thought it was new. I don't fit second-hand carpets. They're awkward. I don't know why they're awkward. I said, oh, well, um, OK, I, I don't know what we do then. And he said, I'll have to charge you more. So he started the work. And while he was fitting the carpet, we were chatting and he said he wanted a computer monitor. So I said, I'll tell you what, I'll give you a computer monitor instead of you charging me extra. Oh, OK, he said. I went upstairs. It was Trisha's. I, <laughs> I took her computer monitor and gave it to the carpet fitter. So he didn't charge me any more than the agreed price. It's OK, I, I didn't steal her monitor. I did replace it. Well, I did steal her monitor. I replaced it. We had several up in the loft. So before she got home, I grabbed another one from the loft and plonked it on her desk, and all was well. <laughs> she did notice, though. Where's my monitor? Oh, well, I gave that to the carpet fitter. <laughs> With local amateur radio friends... I've swapped things. I've got a so-and-so radio that I now don't want, surplus to requirements. And someone might say, oh, well, I've got whatever. I've got an oscilloscope. Oh, I'll have that. Do you want to swap? Yes, I've done that many times over the years. I'll give you my radio for your oscilloscope or I'll have your tape recorder in exchange for whatever. In fact, there was a chap locally, he's passed away now. 
He insisted on swaps. He didn't want money. He wanted to swap everything, which was quite handy because I've got loads of radio gear. I'm looking around my high-tech studio, spare bedroom, was spare bedroom, and there's radios out on the shelves here. I've got CB radios, all sorts of amateur radio gear. You know, some of it's worth a lot of money. It's worth having. So it's quite nice just to be able to swap. In fact, talking of CB radios, back in the 70s, again, early 80s, I used to repair CB radios for the local lads well, and girls, the local, I say kids, early teens, mid-teens. They'd get a CB second hand or whatever, or it didn't work for whatever reason, or they wanted it tuned up <laughs> or extras fitted. So I did that, charged them a few quid, and I did quite well out of that. Someone would knock on the door, can you do my CB? Yes, yeah, leave it with me. <laughs> of course, that was all cash that I had to declare to the Inland Revenue. Something else I did back in the 70s, which I'd forgotten about, Hoover washing machines, automatic washing machines, had a module, uh, basically a little printed circuit ball with electronic components on, and it controlled the speed of the motor. And they used to burn out. And there were companies around that sort of reconditioned them. You give them the, the burnt out one, and they'd sell you a reconditioned one, a refurbished one. It was an exchange process. You had to give them an old one. Well, I started doing that for people locally. And that was profitable. The components, there were basically three components that burnt out. Dead easy to replace. It took, what, 10 minutes? <laughs> if that. And I did very well out of that. I was charging a little bit less than the company. Where were they? Up in Croydon somewhere. And of course, people would bring me these burnt out uh, control modules. I forget what they're called. Little printed circuit board for Hoover washing machines. And I'd repair them for them. I, t I made up a test jig thing. And I charged them whatever. I did very well out of that. Trisha's just bought me a cup of coffee, which is nice. I think back in those days, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, people were more, what can I say, they weren't work shy. They didn't mind doing a day job and then work in the pub until midnight. And work weekends, when it was their time off, they'd work weekends. They weren't adverse to earning a bit of money on the side, doing a little bit of work like I did with the speed control modules and people mowing lawns and painting and decorating, all sorts. And there's another chap, another chap. He was manager of a shop, electrical shop. He did painting and decorating on the side. <laughs> I remember him, John. His name was, he was always busy wallpapering and painting. Very easy to do, easy work. There's nothing difficult about wallpapering and painting. Obviously, you've got to get it about right. You've got to hang the wallpaper up the right way if it's patterned. And the patterns have to line up. So it's probably not that easy. Not everyone can do it. But he used to do very well on the side. So does this go on these days? Not that I know of. Be interesting. Raise rants at protonmail.com. Raise rants at protonmail.com. Let me know. Do you do jobs on the side? Or have you when you were younger? Or are you younger now doing jobs on the side? You may have heard of the term taking in washing. Now, in the old days, again, in the 50s, I remember, I don't remember people doing it, but I remember hearing about people doing it. Women would take in other people's washing and do it for them, do all the washing, the rinsing and the rest of it, and ironing even, and they would charge people. So if you are busy or you've got lots of, I don't know, kids, you haven't got time to do the washing, because bear in mind back then, a lot of people didn't have a washing machine. Wash day was Monday and it took all day Monday to do the washing. If you were really busy, and you obviously could afford it, you'd give your washing to someone else to do it. And that's the expression, you know, you'd have to take in washing to get some money if you were poor. I remember poor people. I remember people not having any money at all, just about cover their rent and a bite to eat. They didn't have a car. And those, those sort of people in that situation, they would take in washing, they would do ironing, anything like that. Sewing, Darning, mending, sewing, alterations, all this sort of thing went on on the side as sort of private jobs, private work. I wonder whether that happens now. Looking back, there was a, an entire industry, a sort of black market. Was it black market? Not really, was it taking in washing? There was a, an entire sort of industry on the side going on, cottage industry. People doing all sorts of things for cash. Another favourite way for elderly women. Can I say elderly? Is that, is that right? Is that PC politically correct? <laughs> they, 
They would knit things for people, scarves, hats, jumpers, gloves, mittens. They would spend all their time just sitting there knitting. And they would sell their, their wares, their goods, they would sell them to people. That was an easy way of earning money. I think I mentioned recently an old lady used to come into the pub with jars of homemade marmalade. <laughs> and she'd sell them in the pub. Why not? Again, it's cash, isn't it? Anyway, enough about that. I just wonder whether it does happen these days. Do let me know if you pay people cash to do work on the side or if you used to do that. It would be very interesting, actually, to find out whether that still goes on today. It must do to an extent. I'm sure it must do, but that would be interesting. That was one of the benefits or advantages of local pubs. Whatever you wanted done, there was always someone that knew someone in the pub. I want a new PowerPoint fitted in the kitchen. Oh, you want to see Fred? He he does electrical work. He'll sort that out. My tap's dripping. Oh, you want Dave? Dave the plumber. He'll sort that out for you. Of course, the pubs now have gone. How many a week are closing? I can't remember. It's dreadful. It really is dreadful. We're going to a pub tomorrow. Oh, Sunday. It's Saturday today. When you listen to this tomorrow, it's Trisha's birthday. And there are 20 of us in the family, all going out for a meal. <laughs> Sunday lunchtime, well, just after lunch, I think they're fitting us in because there are 20 of us. We booked a table. Can we book a table? Yes, how many of you? 20. What? The girl on the phone was quite surprised. 20? OK, right, yes, we could do that. But, of course, it's not a pub anymore. It's a restaurant. The pubs that are around are now concentrating on food. So, of course, you've lost the, the locals, the regulars that all used to chat to each other. Do you know anyone that can sort my car out? I think it needs plugs or something. The points need replacing. Oh, you want to see old Richard over there? He'll sort that out for you. He does cars. That's all gone because the pubs have gone. What pubs there are left aren't pubs anymore. It's such a shame. Moving on to modern times. Did I tell you we bought a, what are they called, thermo pot, a, a thermo boiler? It's a, like a tea urn thing. More tea urn. Oh, thanks very much. <laughs> Sorry. And we bought this, this kettle thing. You just sort of put your cup under it whenever you want boiling water for tea or whatever it is you're making. And it's quite handy. It's just there all the time. You leave it on permanently. We'd only had it perhaps a week and a half, couple of weeks. It went wrong. So what we did, we emailed them and said, look, it's, it's gone wrong. And the chap said, that's fine. No problem. I'll send you another one. Dispose of that one. Well, unfortunately, we'd sent it back. We'd parceled it up and sent it back to him, this this company, whoever they were. The point is, he'd said, dispose of it. It was brand new and it had a fault. I wish we'd kept it now for spares for the, the other one he sent us. Talk about a throwaway world. This thing's brand new. It just had a fault. Surely you'd think that they'd want to repair it? No, no, no. Chuck it away. Awful. Actually, it was quite funny because we received the new one which has been fine, touch wood, ever since. We also got a refund. So we got on to the, the place and we said, look, we've got the new one, thank you very much, but we've also had a refund. How do we send the money to you? You know, we don't want a refund as well as a new boiler thing. And the chap said, oh, that's all right. Don't worry about that, keep it. It was 70-something quid, not a lot, 70-something pounds. So not only <laughs> did we get the new boiler thing for making our tea and coffee, we also got the money back for it. So I don't know. What's happened to the world? It's all gone mad. Our new bed has arrived. We took the old one up to the tip. That was a laugh. Tying the mattress on the roof of the car. With bits of rope going through the windows. <laughs> Highly illegal. But of course we weren't stopped by the police because there aren't any police around anymore. They've all gone. Talking of beds, in the old days, no one bought a new bed, you know, from a bedding shop. You didn't do that. It cost a fortune. People couldn't afford it. My bed, I had a, was it a single bed, three foot six, when I'm a sort of child I'm talking about, up to about the age of, well, in fact, 16. I had this single bed. Was it a four foot? No, that's too big, isn't it? Three foot six or something, single bed, but a big thing, a huge oak frame. And when you take the mattress off, there's all these springs and bits of metal. The thing weighed a ton. It really was heavy. The mattress itself was full of huge springs. They don't have that anymore, do they? And we got the bed from our next door neighbour. <laughs> he was the headmaster of a boys' school. Not any old boys' school, private. 
Is it private or public? Why do they call them public schools? Well, they're not public at all. They're private. Anyway, we got it from the chap next door. He was, yeah, he was retired. I'm sure he was retired. We got it from him. He was giving it away. He bought a new bed. He had a lot of money. What he would do, wouldn't he? Working at a public school or whatever for all his life. Headmaster there. He was a funny chap. I won't go into that. Some of the stories he told me. Anyway, moving on swiftly about boys' schools and things. <laughs> Happy days. But that was my favourite, bestest bed ever. I loved it. And eventually my mum said, we've got to chuck that thing out. We've got to chuck it out. It's huge. I can't move it to vacuum under it. It weighs a tonne. And I didn't want to see it go. Anyway, it went. It went. It went up the tip. And I had this modern, what is it, divan or something they called it? A divan. Awful, dreadful thing. <laughs> Not at all comfortable. Of course, back then we had the mattress and then a sheet or a blanket. No, a blanket, then a sheet then the top sheet, then a blanket or two, then the eider down, or the candle, was it candle wick? Do you, who remembers the candle wick? Bedspread. That's the word I'm looking for, the candle wick bedspread. And it's all tucked in and the rest of it. I remember when I first got married, we had this quilt. This was this new idea, this quilt thing. I didn't like it at all. It kept falling off. It wasn't tucked in. It was just, I don't know, I got used to it, obviously, in the end. Yeah, we both did, but I, I didn't like this quilt idea. Duvet. Do, I mean, what are you talking about, duvet? Bring back the sheets and blankets and the proper eider down. Even now, we have trouble with the duvet. Trish blames me for pulling it all over my side, so she ends up with her feet sticking out or legs sticking out. It's, I don't know, it's not, I don't pull it over. She kicks it off because she's hot. It's then heavier my side than hers, so it falls on the floor, my side. If we had proper sheets and blankets, like they do in hospital, the way nurses make beds, all folded properly and tucked in, you'd never escape. You'd never get out of there, even if you wanted to. <laughs> Perhaps I should ask Nurse Diane. If we get sheets and blankets, can she make our bed for us? I think I know what she'd say. We're coming to the end of another podcast episode. Hope you've enjoyed it as much as I've enjoyed rabbiting away to you. Oh, I fixed my bad back problem. Who's got a bad back? I know loads of people have bad backs. In fact, something like 90% of the population, is it, have bad backs. What I did, I stretched. I've tried all these exercises, but I've stretched. What my dad used to do years ago, he used to hang by his hands in the garden. He made this, he had this frame thing, and he'd hang hold on to the frame with the two hands and just hang there. And it would somehow, I don't know, open his spine up and it worked. Well, I've been doing that. I've been doing quite a lot of physical work in the garden and we've got this pergola thing I built. I grabbed hold of one of the beams going across and I just sort of hung myself there on my hands, only for a few minutes, and it's cured my bad back. I've got a little twinge now because I've been sitting here for too long, but that's the answer. So I'm going to go and hang in the garden again in a minute. <laughs> the sun has gone. Look at it. We've got wind again. The sun has gone. Absolutely hopeless. Talk about British summer. This is it. No, I shouldn't say that. To be fair, it's not summertime yet. Is it pergola or pergola? Some people call them a pergola. It's a wooden frame, basically, with beams over the top. And we've grown Boston ivy all over it, which looks nice. So pergola or pergola? I've no idea. Have you planned or booked this year's holiday yet? We're off to the Isle of Wight soon. That'll be nice. I just hope we do get some better weather. Where are you off to? Let me know. Raise rants at protonmail.com. Several of you in America that uh, email me on the odd occasion have said that you don't leave the country when you go on holiday. You've no need to leave the country. I suppose not. If you live up north where it gets a bit chilly, you go down to Florida for your summer holiday where it's a bit warmer. Or your vacation. It's a vacation, isn't it? Of course, I don't leave the country these days. I go to the Isle of Wight. <laughs> I don't leave the country. And I'm not anymore. I can't do all that. Airports, I can't do all that. I hate it. In the old days, 50s and 60s, people didn't go abroad on their holidays. They didn't go to Mallorca or anywhere like that. They stayed at home and went out for picnics. Or if they could afford it, they'd go on a caravan site somewhere. Wales or Lake District or wherever drive there with the family in the car, pack all their suitcases, off they go and have a fantastic time. 
Blackpool. I've never been to Blackpool. That's a, or, or was, I don't know whether it is now, a very, very popular holiday resort, Blackpool. Trish went there as a, a child with her parents and her sister. They went there a few times, I think, to Blackpool. I've never been there. I've never been further than North Wales, actually. Hran did know. Hran. Is that right? Hran did know. I can't say it properly. I've never been further north than that. I've not been... Oh, yes, I went to Birmingham once. Is that further north? I've no idea. When I have been away, it's normally down to the West Country. We've been to Kent a few times, which is nice. Or, of course, these days, the Isle of Wight. Even though we're a very small island here, there are so many places that I haven't been to. So many places that are ideal for holiday. Of course, it all depends on the weather, doesn't it? It's all very well going to somewhere where they've got a lovely beach and lovely countryside. But if it's wet, cold, windy and rain all week, <laughs> then there's not much point in going. That's the only problem with Britain. Anywhere you plan to go, any holiday, if the weather's bad, then that's it. You've had it. I've never been to Ireland. That's only across the Irish Sea. I've never been to Ireland. I've never been to Scotland. It's awful, really, isn't it? I've lived here, what, 73 years, my birthday next month. And I've never been to Ireland or Scotland. That's awful, really. Talking of the weather, I think it was last year, maybe the year before, we were on the Isle of Wight in a queue of traffic, just at the traffic lights, and suddenly hailstones. The noise in the car, these hailstones, it was dreadful. <laughs> we were in the car laughing. Trisha's mum and her friend and us two were laughing our heads off in this car. We are on our summer holiday and you couldn't hear yourself think for the hailstones. It was only a quick shower. It just moved over and the sun came out again. But that was funny. I'm looking forward to the Isle of Wight. I always look forward to that, as you know. And I shall bore you all to bits by telling you all about it when we get home. <laughs> Happy days. I think it's time I went out into the garden. The sun's shining. It's Saturday lunchtime. Trisha's mum is here for lunch, so I better go and show my face. Being her favourite son-in-law. I always say that to her. I'm your favourite son-in-law. And she says, no, you're not. <laughs> How many sons-in-law? She's got two. Yes, two of us. I had to count then. I had to think. Of course, I do call her my favourite mother-in-law, even though I've only got one. <laughs> it's funny how some people don't get on with mother-in-law, isn't it? I've known many a chap over the years. Can't stand mother-in-law. I don't know why that is. And look at all the mother-in-law jokes over the years. Les Dawson, do you remember him? He used to come out with a load of mother-in-law. Not saying my mother-in-law's fat, but then something about she couldn't get on the bus. I don't know. Couldn't get away with that these days. Humour has all gone. We watched a documentary last night about Bottom. Rick Mail and um, Adrian Edmondson, is it? Yeah, Rick Mail. Bottom. Rick Mail, of course, sadly, has passed away. Aid Edmondson, isn't it? Telling us all about the way they, they filmed it and how they did it all. Really interesting. But as they were saying on the documentary, you couldn't do that these days. You wouldn't get away with it. Which is such a shame because, I don't know, comedy's gone, hasn't it? Humour has gone. Everyone's had a humour bypass, it seems. <laughs> I haven't. I'm not politically correct. I laugh at things I shouldn't. And I'm happy with that. I don't care if people come out with weird or rude comments. What, what does it matter? Let's have a laugh. Let's have a bit of fun, shall we? On that note, take care. Look after yourselves. Have a good week. I will see you on Wednesday, of course, with the midweek message. If you do anything naughty, don't get caught. <laughs> I certainly won't. Well, I might. Take care and I shall see you on Wednesday. Bye bye for now.